everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. On behalf of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro and OCAD, I want to welcome and thank you all. My name is Aline Serfati, and I'm here with Dr. Hilary Eumanns, who coordinates and moderates this series with me. Our guest speakers today are Drs. Rodrigo Aguiar, Erin Leia, Diana Afonso, and Linda Probin. We are all very happy to kick off the year with the first session with focus on sports imaging. And it's going to be like this. The speakers will present their cases and at the end, we will have a Q&A session. If you have questions at any time during uh, the presentations, please put them in the chat box. And at the end, uh, the speakers will respond to them. The presentations today will be recorded and available on demand on the OCAD website, which is ocadmsk.com and on the YouTube channel of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro. If you want to join the OCAD community and see challenging cases almost every day, please consider registering on the OCAD website. I can assure you all that it will be very enriching as the website is full of cases and videos of lectures and sessions. A quick reminder, attendees have not been given the permission to screen and record any of these presentations as they may contain material under copyright. An authorized recording use distribution and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. We thank you all for your understanding. And with that, please Hillary, kick off the session. Okay. Um... Erin Alea is going to be our first presenter. She's an assistant professor of radiology at NYU Langone Medical Center and a member of the NYU Langone Medical Center Division of Musculoskeletal Radiology. She graduated from Penn State University in 2006 um, with a degree in biology and earned her medical degree in 2010 from NYU School of Medicine. She did her internship at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York, uh, and then her residency training in diagnostic radiology at Montefiore Medical Center, which is an excellent institution. Um, she was elected and served as chief resident, and following residency, she completed her fellowship in diagnostic and interventional MSK at NYU Langone Medical Center in 2016. Okay, Erin, show us your case. Great, right. thanks for the introdu introduction. Okay. So, hi everyone, it's good to be back for the sports case series. So my case, I'm gonna show first a clinical image. So we have a 38 year old male presenting after a bench press injury. The clinical image is almost diagnostic of his injury. The clinician saw this absent contour of the right anterior axillary fold. So there's a high suspicion for pec tear. So a pec protocol was ordered and here we see the pec protocol MRI with small field of view. I'm looking lateral to the biceps. I'm not seeing an intact pec tendon footprint. I'm following the trail of edema and I see a retracted complete tech pec tendon tear. So today I'm going to be talking about pec tears because it's something that I struggle with. Uh, I, I think a lot of us struggle with pec tears due to this complex anatomy. So the pec functions in humeral adduction, internal rotation, and flexion. It's a, din a dynamic stabilizer of the shoulder, and cosmetically, the pec forms the anterior contour of the axillary fold, as we just saw. So here is that complex anatomy of the pec so we have the much smaller clavicular head, which attaches to the medial clavicle, and then the multi-pennate sternal head, which comprises 80% of the overall volume. Now, it's important to understand biomechanically and in terms of our imaging assessment to make things more simple, that the lower sternal segments, because of their angle and their shorter length, are going to be the first to fail. So good luck finding a pec tear isolated to the clavicular head. It's always going to be the sternal head that fails first. So the pec tendon has this characteristic bilaminar morphology. The anterior layer is formed from the clavicular head and superior uh, sternal head segments. The posterior head receives contributions from the inferior sternal segments. And because of that, the posterior layer is going to be the first to fail. 
Now, in the surgical literature, it's been advocated that pec tendon tears should be described according to width and thickness. But as most of you have, have probably noted, on MRI, it's, it's impossible or nearly impossible to differentiate that anterior and posterior tendon layer. So I think if we've identified the tear as isolated to the tendon and we've described it as complete or partial, we've really done our job. So here we're looking at our PEC protocol. So first we see a, an axial large field view image. It really is a, just a nice bird's eye view of all of the relevant anatomy. We see the entirety of the PEC muscle belly, the sternal and the clavicular heads, the PEC minor, the coracobrachialis, the deltoid, and then finally the PEC footprint, tendon footprint as we're seeing here. I advocate that you really lean on these coronal large field of view images. I think diagnostically, they're going to be really useful in differentiating injury to the clavicular head, which is more superior with those muscle fibers uh, coursing inferiorly, uh, as compared to the sternal head, which is more inferior with those superiorly inserting uh, coursing muscle fibers, as you can see here on this cadaveric dissection. Our small field of view images are going to just beautifully show the pec tendon footprint. You're going to find it just anterior to the biceps, short and long head, as we see here. Again, we see the coracobrachialis, the pec muscle belly, the deltoid. And this is another really important landmark, the cephalic vein. So it's important for surgical exposure to, uh, it's the landmark for the delta pectoral groove. So our surgeons are looking for this for their exposure and on imaging, Edema within the delta pectoral groove is a really nice secondary finding of pec tear. So you're going to find the pec tendon footprint by finding the, ax, uh, the neurovascular bundle leading to the quadrilateral space. The pec tendon footprint is going to be just inferior to that. So pec major tears occur with eccentric contraction with a heavy load. Characteristically, it's going to be someone who is bench pressing and has this injury. They're becoming increasingly common as weight gaining weight training gains popularity and patients are going to present with all of this ecchymosis along the chest wall. Again, you're going to be looking for that absent anterior axillary fold contour. You're going to see this concave defect indicative of pec tear. So pec tears should be described in terms of their timing, location, and extent. So first let's look at some tears that warrant conservative management alone. And those are tears that occur at the muscle origin, the muscle belly, or a low-grade MT junction injury. So here's a nice example of a low-grade uh, injury. We have strain injury, just this focal feathery edema along the sternal head origin. Here's another low-grade injury uh, at the MT junction of the sternal head. We're just seeing a focal area of mild edema. So now let's look at the cases that warrant surgical management. These are high-grade injuries at the MT junction, a tear within the substance of the tendon, or a tear of the tendon at the level of the humeral attachment, which rarely is going to present as a bony avulsion. So again, the tears that warrant surgical manage management are injuries to the tendon, whether it's at the level of the distal MT junction, within the substance of the tendon, or at the level of the humeral attachment. Sorry about that. So here we're going to start by looking at injuries at the level of the MT junction. So I know that the injury is at the MT junction because I see an intact pec tendon footprint just lateral to the biceps. All of the edema is really centered here at the myotendinous junction. And I see on the coronal large field of view images that this is isolated to the more inferior sternal head. Here's another nice example of an MT junction tear isolated to the sternal head. You, a lot of the time with these MT junction injuries, because of the robust vascular supply from the muscle belly, you're going to see large hematoma formation, as you see here. And then finally, here's another example of complete rupture of the sternal head. Again, it's more inferior. The muscle fibers coursing superiorly. I know it's the sternal head at the level of the distal MT junction with large hematoma formation within the tear gap. So there are, we're gonna be moving on now just to complete tendon tears. There have been some ancillary findings which can be very useful, which have been described. Normally an intact 
pec tendon footprint will hold the biceps tendon against the humeral shaft. When you have a complete tear, that biceps is going to become displaced. You'll see peribicipital hematoma formation. And this is perhaps one of the most important slides. I wanna just really pay attention to this slide. There's a characteristic edema pattern along the anterior margin of the coracal brachialis and within the delta pectoral groove. Again, the cephalic vein is your landmark for the delta pectoral groove. When you see that edema pattern, you need to think of pec tear. Why is that so important? Because you're gonna be reading a shoulder MRI where the pec tendon footprint is excluded from the field of view, but you see edema anterior to the coracobrachialis extending into the delta pectoral groove. You raise suspicion for pec tear. This patient got a subsequent dedicated pec protocol, and that's exactly what we see, a complete tendon tear. So here's another example of complete tendon tear. Again, I'm looking lateral to the biceps for an intact tendon attachment. I'm not seeing it. I'm, the biceps has been displaced. I'm following the trail of edema, that characteristic pattern, coracobrachialis, delta pectoral groove, and I found the retracted tendon stump. Here's another uh, almost identical uh, example of a complete retracted tendon tear. And then finally, here's another complete tendon tear. But in this case, we also have uh, injury to the sternal head myotendinous junction, and I've identified it easily as a sternal, sternal head involvement uh, on the coronal large field of view images. Here's what our surgeons are seeing in the OR for a complete tendon tear. And then finally, occasionally we're gonna encounter these chronic tears, which we all hate because we don't have the pattern of edema to kind of lead us to the site of injury. But we look at the axial large field of view images. I see that intact tendon footprint. I see scarring and fatty atrophy right here. And on the coronal large field of view images, you can just really see that that MT junction chronic injury is isolated to the sternal head. So in chronic tears that undergo an uh, allograft reconstruction, a lot of times our surgeons are gonna use an Achilles allograft as you see here. And this is the typical post-operative appearance with those cortical buttons along the humeral shaft. So thank you everyone. Uh, please reach out to me with any questions. Thank you very much, Erin. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Diana Consul. She's a consultant radiologist of the MSK Imaging Department of Hospital da Luz in Lisbon and of Hospital Particular da Madeira in Funchal, Portugal, with full-time dedication to MSK Imaging. She's interested in all areas of MSK Imaging with emphasis on sports imaging. She has authored and co-authored articles and book chapters on MSK, including the ESSR guidelines for MR Imaging, of sports injuries and the Lisbon Agreement of FAI Imaging. She's also a very active MSK educator, lecturing several orthopedic and imaging courses, having co-organized the ESSR 2019 annual meeting in Lisbon. Other than radiology, she loves traveling, especially to sunny destinations. And that's why I know she's coming to Brazil. <laughs> And in a month, and she also likes people who, with good sense of humor and, of course, good wines. Please, Diane, share your okay. I will share my screen. Uh, now we're good, right? Okay, yeah. perfect. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks the, for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure. I'm Diana Afonso, I come from Lisbon, Portugal. So I will start with this case. I will we'll start with this case. This is a 40 year old male, a very active weekend tennis and the paddle player. He complained of, of chronic lateral elbow pain. The pain was um, located on a bony lateral epicondyle and radiated along the forearm. Cousin test for lateral epicondylite was positive, and the patient had no signs of frank stability, nor the range of motion was affected. So the diagnosis here was, in fact, straightforward. So he had a lateral epicondylitis. So whenever the history and the physical findings are typical, imaging may not be routinely required. This is OK. This, uh, this, is, uh, this, this, uh, this is OK, and this is uh, according to the clinical guidelines. 
So this patient had medical treatment, but after almost a year or so, he didn't get better. In fact, recalcitrant symptoms occur up to 10% of these cases of lateral epicondylitis. This patient seeked for a second medical opinion, and this time imaging was ordered in order to clar clarify the, different, the diagnosis and shorten the differential. So we know that epicondylitis is by far the most common cause of lateral elbow pain. However, there are other causes of lateral elbow pain that we need to be aware of, including intraarticular causes. Like for instance, an intraarticular plica leading to lateral elbow pain what we so call the radio umeral plica syndrome. Or we can have injuries on the lateral ligaments. And so far, the local has been regarded as the most important one. So when we have a torn local, we'll have a postural lateral rotator instability, which is another cause of frank instability and lateral elbow compliance. However, if the other lateral ligaments that have been overlooked in the past, namely the radial collateral ligament and the annular ligament are injury, we can also have a different condition. We can have micro instability of the lateral elbow, which is now known as smile syndrome. So this was the MRI of our patient. So we can actually see here a generated common extensive tendon with a high-grade partial tear in the anterior component, component, that is the extensor carpal radialis brevis. Furthermore, we can also have changes in the radial collateral ligament, which is parallel to the extensor carpal radialis brevis, as seen here, which is thick and irregular. Plus, as you can see, the annular ligament is elongated with redundancy of the re recess as well seen here. We can also have subtle signs of radio capital or chondral fraying with bone, bone marrow edema-like changes, and maybe we can also have some subtle synovitis. And another important finding in this, on this MRI is the absence of a thickened radio humor plica. So based on these findings, we can actually presume we are dealing with symptomatic minor instability of the lateral elbow, meaning smile, associated with recalcitrant lateral epicondylitis. So let's get back to the definitions. What is this new concept? So in 2017, this paper was presented at ESCA meeting and later published and brought the concept of SMILE for the first time. And to understand this concept, we need to bear in mind two conditions. Is that one, owing to the intimate uh, anatomic position of the extensor carpi radialis brevis tendinous insertion right then next to the radial collateral ligament, any damage to the extensor carpal radialis brevis is also expected to affect the radial collateral uh, ligament. Plus, also important, the radial collateral ligament, as seen here, will blend distally with the annual ligament. So they are all anatomic, anatomic related. A second point you need to, to bear in mind is that the radial collateral ligament is a secondary static virus stabilizers and its deficiency, deficiency will be clinical important. And at the same time, the extensor carpal radialis brevis acts as a dynamic stabilizer against ferrous pronation stress. So in other words, when the static stabilizers, meaning the radial collateral ligament and the annular ligament fail, the extensor carpal radialis brevis will be overloaded and become painful. So these are the two uh, conditions we need, to cons we need to bear in mind to understand SMILE. So SMILE can be triggered by a persistent virus repetitive stress that results from repetitive or persistent low energy daily normal tasks performed with the shoulder in moderate abduction, elbow flexion, and forearm pronation. So in this position, we'll have a virus pronation load on the lateral elbow. And with time, this can lead to progressive stretching and overload on the various static stabilizers, meaning on the radial collateral ligament and on the annular ligament. This will result in micro instability or ligament patholaxity, meaning we'll have an increased mobility of the radial head with minor incongruency of the proximal radial ulnar joint 
that will result with local impingement, with chondral fraying of the radial head and capitello, and finally, some synovitis. And this, this deficiency on the static stabilizers, in the end, will cause an overuse of the dynamic stabilizers, naming, naming, namely an overuse and fatigue of the extensor radialis brevis leading to lateral epicondylitis. So basically, lateral epicondylitis can therefore be seen as the final result of repetitive and persistent loads and overuse on the radial collateral ligaments. So they scope these patients. So as you can see here, this from my colleagues from Lisbon, from the shoulder PT group, this is the scope of the same patient. So we can see here, this is the radial head, this is the neck. This is not normal to be seen. So you, theoretically, you should not see the radial neck. This is way too lax. So this is almost a drive-through sign. This is completely lax. They put the prop, they put the hook, and you can almost, this is the drive-through sign. So it's completely lax. Plus, we have a lot of synovitis, a lot of going of stuff going on in joint. Plus, if you look back, we can also see another things like here. I'll stop the video, put pause. Yeah. Besides this uh, drive-through sign, all this laxity, this exposure of the radial neck that is not supposed to happen. We can also have this here. This is a... Um, an anterior capsule partial tear. And right next to it, there's this abnormal yellow structure. This is the radial collateral ligament that is generates, it's not normal at all. It shouldn't be seen like this. And then we have a lot of synovitis. This is also not normal. And also some chondral fraying. So MRI findings were confirmed on atroscopy. So the patient was treated accordingly. This is another companion case. Again, an, uh, an adult male with a recalcitrant elbow lateral pain, generation and tear of the common accessory tendon, the radial collateral is the ligament, and of course we have redundancy of the annular lease recess. So to sum up, we should be aware of this condition and look for these subtle intraarticular signs, such as synovitis of the radial head and the proximal radial nerve joints chondral damage of the radial head and the capitalum, annular recess redundance with an intact but elongated annular ligament, and importantly, no major plicus. And this is important because these findings may suggest minor instability, micro instability, meaning smile, and they will need to be addressed surgically with plicature besides the normal tendon debridement or release usually performed for lateral epicondylitis. So by describing this on our reports, we can help to guide the treatments. So in conclusion, we have different causes of lateral elbow pain. The most common one is ep lateral epicondylitis by far. Smile results from laxity or deficiency of the radial collateral ligament and the annular ligament due to repetitive overload. And when these static stabilizers fail, this will lead to overuse and fatigue of the extensor caporadialis brevis, meaning lateral epicondylitis can be, in fact, the final consequence of smile. So remember, it's important to look from inside out and to look for intraarticular findings that may actually support smile. Thank you from Portugal. And any questions, just read me out. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Okay. It's me now. <laughs> um, now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Rodrigo Aguiar, a very good friend of mine. Rodrigo, Dr. Rodrigo Aguiar is an adjunct professor of musculoskeletal radiology at the Federal University of Paraná. He completed residency at Hospital das Clínicas at the Federal University of Paraná, and he did his MSK research fellowship at the University of California, San Diego. He's a practicing musculoskeletal radiologist uh, at DAPI Clinic in Curitiba, South Brazil. And he's very involved in, in musculoskeletal radiology education, having presented at radiologic uh, national conferences. And he has also authored several peer-reviewed scientific articles and co-authored book chapters. Please, Rodrigo, take it away. 
Hi, thank you, Aline, for the introduction. And let me share my screen with you guys. Okay, can, can you see yeah. my presentation? Okay, so it's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, Hillary and Aline. And it's an honor to be here with the other speakers too. And by the way, the, the first two presentations, they were superb. And I try to do my part here in this meeting today. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we have a fight case. Well, last year was a tennis case. Today it's gonna be a fight, a fight case. And not it's not gonna be in a rocky style. It's gonna be in a more Van Damme style, and you will understand why in a second. So that's our case, right? A 20-year-old female amateur uh, MMA fighter. Uh, she was training Mai Tai and she had foot drop after uh, five, day, five days of an intense kick training session while training Mai Tai. Uh, the history was this one. Her coach kicked her posterior upper thigh uh, many times, a lot. And she, uh, in this area here, she also presented with hematomas in this region. So uh, she went to the clinic to perform um, MRI. So, and during the MRI, uh, it was asked, we did a, a, a hip MRI and we could notice here, this is the axial stir image. And you can see here the normal sciatic nerve on the right. And uh, on the left, we can see a high signal and a thickening of the left sciatic nerve. And here in the axial stir, uh, consecutive images, we can see this high signal intensity and the thickening of the left sciatic nerve um, uh, very close to the uh, ischial tuberosity, very close to the, to the, to the, uh, to the greater trochanter uh, of the femur. And here in the coronal stir image, we can see here is the normal right sciatic nerve. And here is the abnormal left sciatic nerve. Okay, so you can see the difference between these two nerves and we can notice that this one, the left one, uh, something is wrong with this nerve. And here is our uh, T2 space stir imaging showing the high signal intensity of the left sciatic nerve comparing to the right sciatic nerve. So here this nerve is a little bit more uh, thickened and also it has a, a more a high signal intensity in this nerve. And we also injected contrast in this patient because by the way, they start imaging, we do they still, uh, they start imaging after contrast because the image is better. I'm not gonna enter in this, in the technical part of the, the protocol right now, but after contrast, contrast, we can see also a contrast enhancement of the left, uh, left sci sciatic nerve this patient, this patient also had a chronic ischial femoral impingement. That was a, she had a deep gluteal, gluteal pain that she was being treated because of this deep gluteal pain. But this is an old finding. And this one, this high signal intensity of the left sciatic nerve, that's the new finding after the training session. So in the coronal plane, uh, now we can see the thighs. And we can see here, here's the, the left sciatic nerve uh, thickened and with high signal, we can see high signal intensity in, the, in the, the lower muscles of the thigh. Here's the long head of the biceps femoris with a uh, high signal intensity showing some degree of uh, acute denervation. And here uh, uh, we can see the legs and we can notice that the left leg, there is a, already a volumetric loss and a slightly high signal of the muscles of the right, the left leg in comparison to the right leg, okay? And one year later, I uh, asked the patient to come back because I want to report this case, this case. And one year later, she was okay. So here is the sciatic nerve, the right sciatic nerve and the left sciatic nerve. You can see that's normal right now. She was asymptomatic. The treatment was... Uh, or uh, the, uh, the treatment was a, a, a conservative treatment. And after one month, 
she recovered all the functions, all the movements of the leg. And you can see that the, this new MRI is normal one year later. Okay, so that is a case of a traumatic sciatic neuropathy uh, caused by leg strikes in a Mai Tai fighter, in an MMA fighter, and she was training Mai Tai uh, when it occurred, occurred. And I went to literature and I couldn't find any case of a sciatic neuropathy caused by leg strikes, okay? And I, and I used many different uh, terms to try to find some case of sciatic nerve uh, neuropathy caused by leg strikes and I couldn't find, I went to the, to the, uh, like to the MMA community <laughs> to try to find something. And what I could find uh, instead uh, was a vast material uh, on YouTube about talking about leg kicks and foot drop uh, by common peroneal nerve damage. Okay, so here, this video shows, uh, shows a lot of cases with, uh, with foot drop, instant, almost instant foot drop after leg kicks. Uh, there is another video with a doctor explaining uh, a, a patient with a foot drop after leg kick, another video explaining that. And we can't find that on the medical literature. On, for example, there is also a book talking about how to deliver this kick to be more effective uh, as possible. And we couldn't find, I couldn't find almost anything on the, on the literature. The only paper that I found about the foot drop, uh, so about the sciatic nerve, forget. I, I, I have found anything. But uh, about the foot drop, that was the, the only paper that I found, okay? And this paper, it's not on PubMed, okay? Uh, this uh, this uh, this magazine is not on PubMed, but I could find that I could I couldn't find other sources. And uh, there is a, a, a misspelling here; they corrected here, but uh, I, it couldn't help me to to think about uh, this simulated situation here. So let's come back to the case. And I want to talk a little bit more about these leg kicks and uh, at least a peroneal neuropathy that we can see in MMA fighters, uh, generally speaking. So here you can see the peroneal nerve, the superficial peroneal nerve, and the deep peroneal nerve. And uh, in this area here, around the fibular head, uh, this nerve, it courses around the fibular head, and also it courses between uh, the tendinous origins of the peroneal longus muscle through a fibrous osseous tunnel. So this, in this area, the nerve is superficial and lacks mobility, right? So direct trauma in this region can damage the nerve. And uh, how it happens, uh, uh, it causes with compression and crush, uh, it causes local ischemia, increased vascular permeability, in neuropathy of the nerve. So they, the MMA fighters, they, fight, they use that uh, in the fights a lot. And I'm gonna show you a case of that in a minute. And another cause of a peroneal, common peroneal nerve failure or uh, damage is a compartment syndrome. They uh, use kick legs, uh, kick legs constantly, many times during the fight, during the training, and it can cause a compartment syndrome, an anterior or lateral compartment syndrome. And if the pressure is higher than 30 millimeters of mercury, it can cause paresthesia. And if it's more than 60 uh, millimeters of mercury, it can complete block uh, the nerve conduction, right? So these are the two causes how it can cause uh, a neuropathy. Uh, for example, at the peroneal nerve, in this area near to the fibula head. So I went to my files and I swear of God, in 10 minutes, I found a case. And this, uh, I could find this case in my files, a 36 year old female Jiu Jitsu and MMA fighter with foot drop after a MMA tournament. And we can see here the common peroneal nerve. There is a neuropathy here. You can see some fibrosis tissue uh, around the peroneal nerve in this area right here. We can also see the, the muscle denervation in this area right here. 
So uh, the peroneal nerve is here, the peroneal neuropathy. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, the trauma was like two or three weeks later. I think it's a, it's a little bit chronic right now. And I don't know if it's, it's just because of this, the last tournament, maybe they, uh, this patient had multiple, uh, multiple lesions uh, because of the multiple fights and multiple tournaments in training. And we can see that the, it's not just acute. There is a chronic lesion uh, in, uh, around the peroneal nerve. What uh, talks about uh, so somewhat uh, acute lesion, it's because of the pattern of the muscle denervation here. There is a high signal intensity here in the anterior and lateral compartment. And here in the T1 uh, weighted image, we can see some streaks of fat, but it looks like to be something new, something like a subacute denervation in this patient. Okay, so I, I, I found this case in 10 minutes that I went to my files and I found this case. So I, uh, it, it was very straightforward. Like, I just went there and, and I found this case it was very, oh, 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 I was very lucky or something that happens with some frequency. So I went to literature to talk about, to see about uh, the main lesions of the, uh, the different fights about the MMA uh, fighters. And there is a lot of controversy in the literature, different conclusions. Uh, some papers, they tell that it happens more in, uh, in professionals, others in amateurs, but the problem is most of the papers they they just uh, study the professional players during the fights. So, but uh, most of the time the, the the patients the the fighters they are training, not fighting. So a lot of lesions they do occur during training and not just during the competition. And the type of lesion it will uh, differs depending on what is the type of uh, fight. For example, uh, boxing, there's a lot of face, facial and head injury. Mai Tai kickboxer, a lot of uh, facial and also lower limb injuries during the strikes and grappling sports like Jiu Jitsu and wrestling, wrestling and Judo. That is a lot of uh, uh, joint lesions, not strikes, but more joint lesions due to torsions uh, because of the gra grappling nature of some of these sports. Okay, so that's something that I'd like to highlight here, difference between professional and amateur. The, the majority of our patients, they are amateurs. They don't compete or maybe they pass almost all the, the time training and not competing. And we need to be aware of this type of lesion. We need to be aware that uh, if you see uh, a denervation, uh, uh, a nerve lesion, a denervation in a young patient, uh, you should think about uh, some kind of, uh, uh, if, the, if the patient uh, is a fighter, if this patient, it, he, he or she trains, or if they fight last week, something like that. Okay, so keep that in mind. So next time that you see uh, an exam like that coming at you, uh, be aggressive and look for the nerves and look for the, the, the muscles around the nerves and think about this, right? Think about this, the leg strikes in this, this type of athletes, of these fighters, because it is a type of lesion. It was very hard to find something on the literature talking about that. But uh, on, on like on YouTube, other channels and in the MMA community, they talk a lot about the leg strikes. Uh, it's something that is in a, is a hype right now, the leg strikes. And we need to be aware of that. Okay. So I think that now we are better prepared for our next fight uh, when we get uh, an exam like that uh, to report. So that's it for my case. Fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, okay, everybody, it is my honor to introduce my good friend who's an amazing radiologist and teacher, Dr. Linda Probin. She is an associate professor 
and musculoskeletal radiologist at the University of Toronto. She's the past program director for the Diagnostic Radiology Program and now the vice chair of education for the Department of Medical Imaging and the current chair of the specialty committee for diagnostic radiology at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. She has interests in osteoporosis, arthritis, ultrasound, sports injuries, and trauma, as well as teaching and education, including the use of ultrasound simulation. She's published several scholarly articles and presents her work and teaches at many national and international conferences. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction and hopefully you can see my screen here. Um, so, and thank you, Hillary and Aline for the invitation. It's nice to be back again. And the uh, to my co-presenters, uh, really great talks and presentations so far. So thank you for that. And we are going to switch gears and talk about um, a non-contact sport now. We're gonna talk about cycling. And in particular, we're gonna talk about neural compression syndromes of the wrist. Um, I like to call them handlebar hazards in cycling. So we're going to um, understand different types of neural compression injuries related to handlebars and cyclists, discuss relevant imaging and review some prevention. So wrist pain is common in cycling because cyclists lean forward on the handlebars, putting weight through the wrists and hands and cyclists complain of pain, tingling, and numbness in the hands, usually related to involvement of the median or ulnar nerves. And you may see some cyclists, uh, as in this video, taking their hand off the handlebars, that's me by the way, um, shaking their hands in an attempt to alleviate uh, their symptoms. So there are many different types of handlebars depending on which type of bike um, is being used, and this includes mountain bike and road bike handlebars. But either way, there is excess stress applied to the wrist due to the hyperextension and direct pressure placed on the wrist, ultimately resulting in wrist pain with variable neurologic symptoms. We're gonna just quickly review the handlebar anatomy of a road bike because it's not a straight bar, just so you know the terminology. So the portion at the top is called the tops. So that's pretty straightforward. The front part connected to the brake is called the hood and the lower part is called the drops. So I'm gonna present now a case that we had. This is a 32 year old man, he's a cyclist and he is complaining of numbness and weakness in the hand and the fourth and fifth fingers in particular. So this patient came to ultrasound and on this transverse ultrasound image, which is at the volar aspect of the wrist at the level of the pisiform, you can see a hypoechoic lesion that is adjacent to the ulnar nerve. And you can see here also on this video loop, the lesion is anechoic and appears cystic with posterior acoustic enhancement. And you can see the ulnar nerve right there is being displaced by the cyst. So we're just gonna review the anatomy of the ulnar nerve. So the ulnar nerve passes into the wrist at the level of Guillain's canal, and it's highlighted here in yellow where it gives off terminal branches. And the nerve supplies sensation to the fifth finger and the ulnar half of the fourth finger, and motor supply is to the intrinsics, including the adductor pollicis, deep head of the flex. Polysis brevis, the interosteae, and the fourth a rigid canal, which is shown in the axial T1 MR image and transverse ultrasound image. The canal is bordered medially by the pisiform and the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon. And at the superficial aspect is the palmar carpal ligament. And this is an extension of the flexor retinaculum. And the, the deep margin is the flexor retinaculum. So Guillain's canal is where the ulnar artery indicated by the red dot here passes as well as the nerve which is indicated by the yellow circle. So neuropathy of the ulnar nerve at the level of Guillain's canal is also called ulnar tunnel syndrome and after passing through Guillain's canal the nerve divides and it divides into um, three, three components or three. The first is called zone one and that's indicated by the yellow here. And in this area, if there's compression, the ulnar nerve will cause both motor and sensory dysfunction. Distally, um, the, in the, indicated by the green, this is called zone two and compression at this level will cause motor deficits only. And there is a more superficial branch. This is zone three and this uh, compression at this level will cause um, only sensory abnormality. 
Injury to the ulnar nerve can be due to compression on the handlebars, which may be acute or chronic due to development of a mass or ganglion cyst or other causes. And this ultimately causes compression of the, the nerve and the symptoms are dependent on the location of the compression and the injury. The site of compression or injury may also be variable depending on the hand grip and positioning on the handlebars. And here is a schematic just demonstrating the compression of the ulnar nerve with the hand positioned on the drops. So back to our case of the patient who had the numbness in the fourth and fifth fingers. Um, this patient um, uh, was aspirated. We aspirated this ganglion cyst and we got this mucoid material uh, from the ganglion cyst. And this patient's symptoms were relieved over the course of the next few days after the aspiration. So the median nerve can also be compressed um, and causes symptoms in cyclists. The median nerve passes through the carpal tunnel and gives off terminal branches, as you can see here highlighted in yellow. And it supplies sensation to the first, to the thumb, the first, the second, the third finger, and radial half of the fourth finger, as indicated in yellow. And the motor supplies to the opponent's pollicis, the abductor pollicis brevis, a portion of the flexor pollicis brevis, and the first and second lumbricals. Compression of the median nerve uh, in cyclists tends to be more common with the hands positioned on the tops on road bikes and more common in mountain bikes. Here is a schematic uh, just showing the compression of the median nerve um, as it is uh, the hand is positioned on the tops or the flat part of the handlebar. So the median nerve is quite mobile and moves freely with uh, movement of the fingers and the tendons. And you can see here, the median nerve is just uh, indicated by the yellow arrow there. You can see how freely it moves just with moving the, the fingers and the tendons. Diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome is variable in the literature. The median nerve is measured in cross-section area by outlining the nerve on the ultrasound machine below the flexor, flexor retinaculum, which subsequently calculates the cross-sectional area. And it's generally accepted that less than eight millimeters squared is considered normal and between eight to 12 millimeters squared is borderline and more than 12 millimeters squared is abnormal. Other ways to diagnose carpal tunnel syndrome include bowing of the flexor retinaculum, more than two millimeters beyond a line connecting the pisiform and the scaphoid. And you can also have distal flattening and proximal enlargement of the nerve, um, comparing the area of the nerve at the level of the pronator quadratus to that at the level of the carpal tunnel. And with enlargement of two or more millimeters squared, resulting um, in a 90% sensitivity and 100% specificity for the diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome. There are some normal variants that you should be aware of. Um, there's a bifid median nerve and rarely a trifid median nerve. You can see here's just an example of a trifid median nerve. Um, and in this video loop here, the median nerve is here indicated by the yellow arrow. And as you follow the nerve distally through the carpal tunnel, it divides into three separate components. So surgery is definitive uh, management for uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, but the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons clinical practice guidelines suggest local steroid or splinting before surgery. And the response rate uh, with steroid injection is up to 76%. Um, but the response rate for splinting is also similar, but if you do both together, steroids and splinting, it does not um, alter the outcome. So it's a similar um, uh, result. So here's an example of an enlarged median nerve traversing below the flexor retinaculum. Ultrasound guided microsurgery technique for carpal tunnel release is relatively new and performed in certain institutions. It's minimally invasive and a blunt cannula is placed um, deep to the flexor retinaculum under ultrasound guidance and a cutting surface uh, separates the retinaculum allowing for the carpal tunnel release. We do a fair bit of ultrasound guided median nerve injections. It's an in-plane injection because the needle tip needs to be seen and the injection is performed close to the border of the retinaculum at the level of the wrist crease. Here is a patient with a very enlarged median nerve seen on the axial T2 fat suppressed MR image and on the corresponding ultrasound, the median nerve is very enlarged. And in this case, it's 32 millimeters squared. And there's also a change in caliber as it travels below the flexor retinaculum. So here we're performing an injection. You can see the uh, needle is inserted into the perineural region. 
um, right here, and there's injection of 40 milligrams of steroid and a cc of lidocaine, and uh, we perform neurolysis of the nerve. And you can see here in this video loop that there's fluid and steroid medication surrounding the nerve after the injection. And this patient had markedly improved symptoms after this procedure. But um, there are some considerations. Parent, patients usually have numbness um, until the freezing wears off, and so patients need to be a bit careful when um, performing certain activities. So how do you prevent neural compression um, syndromes in cyclists? Well, um, first of all, changing the grip. Frequently changing the grip and the position on the handlebars is quite helpful. Using different types of handlebars, there are many different types available, uh, various widths and shapes of handlebars. Um, handlebar tape can um, provide some shock absorption. There's different types of, of tapes available, and there's also different types of handlebars, and some which uh, have suspension to provide extra shock absorption. Proper positioning on the bike is really important. You want to make sure that you're not leaning forward too much and putting too much pressure through the handlebars, and also proper technique. The wrist should be relaxed and the elbows bent. There are also different types of gloves that can be used, including gel and foam. And there was a study that was performed comparing no gloves to gel and foam gloves with different hand positions, including you can see at the top there, it says the tops, the drops, and the hoods. And you can see here that um, the drops position in the middle resulted in the highest average peak pressure magnitude for that position over the hypothenar eminence. And wearing padded gloves did not substantially change the pressure profile, but did diminish the peak pressure as seen uh, graphically on these images. So in summary, median and ulnar nerves are common sites of compression syndromes in cyclists. Knowing the anatomy is important to understand the cause. Appropriate imaging should be performed to assess for compressive lesions and prevention helps to reduce the incidence of neural compression injuries related to uh, handlebar um, uh, neuropathies in cyclists. Thank you so much for your attention and uh, really appreciate again attending. Thank you all for the amazing cases. Hillary, you asked the first question to Diane. Yes, she yeah. asked, but maybe she can uh, share the answer. She, When she um, was presenting, she kept saying if the, um, if the lateral plica looked normal, you would consider the diagnosis of smile. So I was wondering if they're mutually exclusive. Can you have the two of them together, or if you see an abnormal looking lateral plica, um, do you dispense with the uh, concept of smile? Well, it's just like I answered on, on chat, we can have both, but so far we don't know. When we have a plica, we tend to favor plica syndrome because it's more known. And probably if you have a lateral, the, con the, the right clinical setting, if you have a lateral epicondylite recalcitrant, probably smile is defi definitely in the differential. But what we know for sure, if you don't have a plica, we consider smile until proven otherwise. But we are still in the tip of the iceberg. We are still, this is a new definition. So let's see what the future holds. There's a, thank you, Diane. There's a question for Erin. Uh, uh, where do you see more often the pec major lesion, empty junction, or distal tendon? And thanks for the lectures, great lectures. Thanks. I mean, we see both. So I honestly, I looked up a surgical case series and I think that the tears at the level of the tendon attachment onto the humerus are just are slightly more common than the MT junction injuries. But we see, I would say in my clinical practice, I, I would say 50-50, but it's slightly more common to have a tear at the tendon attachment onto the humerus. Rodrigo, I was wondering why you gave contrast in that case of the sciatic nerve that looked like a light bulb. I have a solution. If people stop kicking each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just hugging. <laughs> yeah, you're just hugging. So, uh, so uh, we, in that case, we, well, we also did a lumbar plexus uh, study, right? And we use a contrast like for lumbar plexus and uh, brachial plexus because it helps us a lot with the stir images because they get much better after contrast because it takes like some uh, art, artifacts of the vessels. And so we, we also use the contrast to, to see if there's something else because 
it's almost always um, a difficult exam, something that we have to dig a little deeper to find what's happening. By, but basically, we always try to always use contrast because it helps us a lot with the steer images. There are, there are two questions for you, Rodrigo, from uh, Eduardo Vezani. Um, he wrote in Portuguese. So was there a reduction in the ISCO camera space? Yeah, yeah, yeah like this, uh, my, uh, the, my, the first patient that I, that I showed the, the sciatic nerve neuropathy, she had a chronic uh, gluteal deep pain and the cause was uh, ischiofemoral impingement. So she had uh, a reduction of this space bilaterally. And also from Eduardo Brown to you, Rodrigo, do you see, do you use uh, PSIF and DTI for MRI and neurography? Yeah, you know, uh, we, we use DTI and PSIF uh, in, conjunct in conjunction with uh, the neuro uh, guy, people that work with us. And to be frank, uh, the neuro, uh, the, the neuro team, they like, they go a little bit deeper in this area and they like to do the reconstructions. And I try to go, I try to see more, they stir images, but I know that we do that on our three Tesla machine. And, but uh, I, I don't, I don't like, uh, uh, I don't uh, spend my time, a lot of my time uh, uh, working with these images, but we do in our case, not all the cases, mainly the cases that we, we, we do on, in our 3T uh, machine. Linda, I have a question, not, not specifically about uh, handlebar in injury, but I'm, I've always been curious. We do all this ultrasound imaging for carpal tunnel syndrome. And I have to always look up the different uh, ratios and size criteria, you know, sometimes when they don't make it by the, you know, the number cutoffs for the cross-sectional area, you look for different criteria. And I mean, I, I wonder, isn't carpal tunnel syndrome a, a clinical syndrome? I mean, these people are coming to us with classic symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome. How, how can we possibly do an imaging study and say, there's no carpal tunnel syndrome. I mean, to me, I wonder what we're doing. I mean, looking for um, support for the concept of doing a carpal tunnel release. I, what's the rationale? Yeah, so most of our referrals are from um, plastic surgeons or um, those who are going to you know, operate and they're really just looking for, they've, they've pretty much made the diagnosis clinically even they've had EMGs, but they're looking for a compressive lesion, something that's treatable. For example, in the case I showed, the cyclist, you know, we were able to just, you know, um, do an interventional procedure, take it, you know, the, out the mucoid material and relieve the symptoms. So that's that's typically what they're looking for. You're right. The diagnosis is is clinical. I know it's it's variable. The numbers and people get caught up in the actual numbers. But I mean, we see big median nerves with patients that don't have symptoms and, you know, a bigger person is going to have a larger nerve and smaller, you know, so it just, you're right, it has, you have, it's a piece of the puzzle and, but we, our referrals are typically to look for something compressing that we can treat um, that they don't have to operate on. So that's our, typically our, our referral pattern. Thank you. Linda, there's another question for you here from the audience for the, um, for the last crystal for you. Do you search for nerve median artery? Median. The, just the vessel. So we we always put um, like Doppler on to see if there's flow, if there's an abnormal vessel. Yeah, absolutely. We would look at that. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't, it's very unusual. I guess it, you could potentially have vascular structures that could also be causing compression of structures in the carpal tunnel that's certain um but yeah so we always put flow on but we don't specifically um assess the vessels um unless there's a certain indication for it actually linda that that is actually one very good reason to do the ultrasound mm -hmm. because i have seen um i think it was one case that i've seen of uh persistent median artery thrombosis and it presents clinically as carpal mm -hmm. tunnel syndrome and 
the median nerve is uh, completely normal in that instance. So the treatment would would be totally different. Yeah, and that's always we always put. Dop you have to put Doppler on. Also, we've seen some like various forms of neuritis too. So just some inflammation of the nerve. Um, these, pa these patients are putting so much pressure on it can, they can even just be, you know, inflamed. And sometimes they just treat them uh, symptomatically with anti-inflammatories and then we, they come back or they, we, you know, we wouldn't necessarily follow those, but so that's another reason to do it. Yeah. yeah there's a good point in the chat there. Median artery is important. Well, looking at the vascular structures before injection, but that's, yeah, that's why we do our injections under ultrasound. So we know exactly that there's not going to be a vascular structure in the way. So that was something I learned from that case because, you know, you go to all these lectures and they tell you when you're reading an MRI or an ultrasound, you should, you should report whether or not there's a persistent median artery, because theoretically, if someone's doing an interventional procedure or, or uh, releasing the carpal tunnel, they could injure that artery. Um, and uh, I understood all those lectures to say that that was associated with the developmentally bifid median nerve. But in fact, that's not, that's, that's not actually overwhelmingly the case. You often have a persistent median artery even with um, a, a, a normal uh, non-bifid median nerve. So you should always be looking for that. And I routinely... Uh, comment on whether it's there or not. There was another question to Diane. MRI arthrography help to diagnose smile? Already answered on the chat, but I will uh, repeat. So far, there's only one study with uh, not MR, not arthro MRI with CT, art, uh, CT, I, with arthro CT only coming from Italy. This is the only study we have uh, so far published with enough papers. But to be honest, my team and I, we believe that plain non-arthrographic MRI is better because we actually don't want to delete the redundancy, the insufficiency of the recess. For us, that's an important clue. But let's see what the future holds. We are just starting to understand the smile. Okay. So thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, we all look forward to the next session, which will be held on March 31st with focus on infection. Bye-bye, thank you.